Over the last uh, several weeks, and in Romans 13, uh, we learned that this is who you think you are and who I think I am. And this is a dream that has turned into a nightmare. This is a vessel of wrath. <laughs> and this is a vessel of mercy. This is who you truly are and who I truly am, a blood vessel that bleeds life and receives life. And that's a decision called love. You're a vessel of love. Romans 13, 10, love fully fills the law. Romans 14, 1, ask for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. Well, I think because of that, um, a friend pointed me to a video that I, this last week, posted on my, um, on my, on my Facebook page. I did this interview, and in this interview I said, I don't believe that Jesus Christ exists. And after the interview, this lady came to me, and she hugged me, and she held me in a way that I've never been loved. I saw, this woman is a Christian. I've never had, I've never experienced a Christian showing that much love and acceptance unconditionally. After that interview, I had a meeting with council members at the, at the church, and they said, Okay, great, now we've done all these interviews and people know and it's growing, Satanism is growing and believe me people it is. And I had to do a ritual by myself to see how do I get more, more power, more influence. And I did this ritual and I opened myself up and Jesus appeared and I was extremely cocky and I said, if you are Jesus, you need to prove it. And he flooded me with the most beautiful love and energy and I recognized it immediately because that woman at the radio station showed it to me. That's how I recognized the love of Christ immediately because four people showed it to me and I didn't understand it at the time. I couldn't understand it because like I said I didn't believe. Even when I was in Christian ministry almost 20 years ago I never knew it until a month or two ago. The love of Christ is unconditional. When you experience it, it is something different. I have for a long time believed that I am not worthy of God's grace. Let me tell you something today. The kingdom of God is not a gated community. The kingdom of God is open to everybody. It's my prayer that you will, you will feel the love. I, I, I pray that the peace of, of Christ will be with you. That's Rian Spiegelar um, in a little edited video of a longer video that he made a few months ago. After Jesus suddenly appeared to him, uninvited in a satanic ritual that he was performing in his satanic church, he said that he recognized the love of God in Christ Jesus because he had experienced the very same thing in this uh, woman who simply hugged him after a radio interview a few weeks before. In the full video, he explains that um, while he was conducting this ritual, Jesus appeared and he was really cocky and he said, if you're Jesus, you're going to have to prove it to me. But then he began to realize that maybe this really was Jesus and he said he was utterly terrified. He thought, I'm in a world of trouble if this is Jesus and he said, I'm scared. And it was then at that that Jesus flooded him with, quote, the most beautiful love and energy. He claims that he couldn't even look into the eyes of Jesus for long because the love was so intense it knocked him to the floor and yet he knew what it was because he had encountered it a couple of weeks before in that woman that just hugged him. After he had such, said such horrid things about her Lord in the radio interview. Rion Svigalar is the co-founder of the Satanic Church of South Africa. 
But now he's left the satanic church and he says he just wants to love people, all people. And so I thought that was pretty cool. So I posted it on my Facebook page with a reference to Zechariah 2. Jerusalem will be inhabited as villages without walls. I will be to her a wall of fire all around her, declares the Lord, and I'll be the glory in her midst. I quoted that because Susan heard that in reference to the sanctuary. And because the new Jerusalem technically, technically is a gated community, but the gates are always open. And it grows to cover the entire earth. And actually, you are the gates. Always open by day, according to the Revelation. And it's always day in that city. So when you're in that city, you're open. Well, I posted that little video. And a Facebook friend I don't know posted another video in response. Warning, warning, warning that Rion Svigalar is actually not a true believer. The fellow who made the video cites a host of concerns, concerns that are also shared in the comment sections under Rion's other, other video. I watched a, a couple of them, an interview, and then the one he made. The concerns, for instance, Rion can't have seen Jesus, they say, because the Bible says Jesus will come on the clouds of heaven and all eyes will see him. In which case, Jesus did not appear to Paul on the road to Damascus. They say Rion can't be telling the truth because it sounds new age. If you were to say that in Greek, you would use the word Ionios, which means of the age, of the age to come, also translated eternal. They say he must be wrong for he says that we all came from one thing and we're all going back to that one thing. Paul would say that we all die in Adam and we are all recapitulated. We're all brought back together in the ultimate Adam, the eschatos Adam, the body of Christ. They say, well, just look at the tattoos and the crystals. It's crucial that we exercise discernment. And I must say, Rion does seem to promote some ideas that I would question and probably debate rather intensely. And Satan does disguise himself as an angel of light, according to the Apostle Paul. And Jesus did tell some respectable-looking folks that they were, in fact, of their father, the devil, that's what scare us. And believe it or not, on numerous occasions, I've actually encountered Satan. And let me tell you, what Satan does to people and what Satan gets people to do to other people is absolutely horrifying. And so I don't want to give any ground to Satan. And I really do not know what Rion Spiegelar will do next. I don't. I mean, maybe he'll transform the world. That's what Jesus did with the chief of sinners, the foremost of all sinners. And of course, I'm not talking about the founder of the satanic church. I'm talking about old rabbi, terrorist, Pharisee, Saul, that we now call St. Paul. Or perhaps, rather than becoming a Paul, Rion will really just go off the rails a little more like Judas, whom I would imagine called Jesus Lord, Lord on several occasions, and yet turned out to be remarkably weak in faith. And Jesus referred to Judas as the son of perdition. That literally means the son of the lost. He was lost. And so, in all seriousness, couldn't Rion Swigalar turn out to be a Judas? Or a Paul? Or a Judas? And won't I have to give an account from my Facebook page on that day when I stand before the judgment seat of God? And so, yeah, I would like some more knowledge of good and evil in reference to Rion Swigalar. And to be honest, I'd like some more knowledge of good and evil in reference to you. For many of you also appear on my Facebook page. And some of you actually appear to be a little, a little, just a little, weak in faith. And so, yeah, a little more knowledge of good and evil with which to judge folks like Rion Svigalar does seem to be in order. Well, in Romans chapter 14, verse 1, after 13 chapters of the most rigorous theological exposition in all of Scripture, all highlighting the absolute importance of, of faith, the necessity of faith, Paul writes, as for the one who was weak in faith, welcome him. Proslambano, literally reach out, take him by the hand, hug him, hug him, 
As for the one who is weak in faith, hug him. Don't debate him. Romans 14, verse 1, as for the one who is weak in faith, just, just hug him. That's what Amy, that's the name he used, uh, the, the woman at the radio station, that's what she did to Rion Spiegel. She didn't even ask my permission, Rion says. She just reached out and hugged me. After all those things I said. And that's what Jesus did to Judas, didn't he? He received Judas' kiss and called him friend. After all those terrible things Judas did and he was doing at the time, and that's what Jesus did to Paul when he appeared to him on the road to Damascus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you, you're persecuting me. And as he stands there glowing like the sun, it's kind of obvious that he let him, right? And that's what he did to you, d didn't he? After all that we did to, to him, he he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Good or evil, they don't know. That's what God does for all of us. Isaiah refers to Jesus as the arm of the Lord. Jesus is the arm of God, embracing this entire goddamned world. Romans 14, verse 1, As for the one who is weak in faith, just hug him. Now, you may not know many ex-Satanists that confess to be Christians, but I bet you do know one or two folks that could be described as weak in faith. Thanksgiving is coming. Just hug them. But now some will say, well, Rion Swigelar is not just weak in faith. We think he has no faith or hope or love. We've got knowledge of good and evil, and so we've judged the faith, hope, and love of Rion Shvigalar. So if he casts out demons, it's got to be by the prince of demons. He's not my brother. He's of his father, the devil, the accuser. So we accuse him of being the accuser. Well, that's all kind of confusing. And so yeah, 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 yeah. We'd all like to know, is Rion Shvigalar in or out? For 1,700 years, the institutional church has been assisting us in this way by giving us more knowledge of good and evil with which to judge folks in or out. Sometimes it's things like correct baptism, particular confessional statements, maybe some indulgences, some works, perhaps the sinner's prayer, but you know, something easy to judge so that we can say, yep, that's faith, hope, and love, or nope, that's not faith, and so that's not my brother. No need for hope or love. Well, even if Rion Svigalar were spawn of the devil, even if he were our enemy, what are we supposed to do with enemies? Remember Paul told us in chapter 12, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Be kind to him. Hug him and you will heap burning coals on his head. Well, anyway, here he writes, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, accept him, just hug him, don't debate him. Verse two, one person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. It seems that some in Rome believed that the Jewish dietary laws were still to be uh, enforced, that they were binding. And all, all people in Rome would have realized that if you bought meat in the meat market, it was most likely sacrificed in a pagan temple to a demon or, or an idol. It's interesting that Paul refers to those with scruples about things like that, things like tattoos and crystals and Harry Potter books. He refers to them as the weak in faith. But check this out. If the strong in faith judge and despise the weak in faith, they become another new kind of weak in faith, maybe even more terrifying weak in faith. Verse two, one person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains and let not the one who abstains judge. The word is just judge. Judge the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? 
It's before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be made to stand. For the Lord is able to make him stand. That is quite a statement. One person judges one day as better than another, while another judges all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Fully convinced of what? Which day it is, or which foods I should eat or, or not eat, or that whatever I do, I'm doing it to the Lord. Verse 6, the one who observes the day observes it in honor of, literally, to the Lord. The one who eats, eats to the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains to the Lord and gives thanks to God. Every day is supposed to be thanksgiving, okay? Verse 7, for none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Now, pray tell, who is not either the dead or the living? Verse 9, for to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you judge your brother? Why do you judge your brother? Well, isn't it obvious, Paul? I need to know who my brother is. Is Rion Svigalar my brother? Is Rion Svigalar a child of God? Is it safe to, to love Rion Svigalar? Cain wants to know. Is Abel my brother? Jacob wants to know. Is Esau my brother? Judah wants to know. Is Joseph my brother? That is, are the Samaritans my neighbors? Are they my brothers? Asks the Jews of Judah. John writes this. Listen closely. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil, the diabolos, the accuser. Whoever does not do right is not of God. That is the one who does not love his brother. Holy. I mean, chew on that, and that will spin you around and throw you into a crisis. I better assume that everyone is my brother, and so love all my brothers, including Rion Spiegelar, or I might be a child of the devil. And who of us is not a child of the devil? For who of us has always done right or always loved his brothers? So I better hope that Jesus is my brother. You know, Cain is Abel's brother, even though he murdered Abel. That's how scripture, that's how um, uh, Paul and John and Jesus, uh, uh, God refer to him in scripture, still, still brothers. And Esau is Jacob's brother, and Jacob is Esau's brother, even though Jacob stole the birthright and the blessing from Esau, the firstborn. And Jesus is still our brother, even though we murdered him and tried to steal his blessing and birthright, all at the instigation of the devil, even though we sold ourselves to the devil and became children of the lie. Jesus is still our brother. And so we all still have one father. That's what Paul just plainly says. Verse 10, why do you judge your brother? See, I think that's a question that Paul wants us to ponder. Why do you judge your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? Set him at nothing. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will confess to God. You see, that obviously means that everyone with a tongue or a knee is my brother. And Paul already told us, chapter 10, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It obviously means that everyone with a tongue or a knee in the past, present, or the future is my brother and a child of God, even if they are also spawn of the devil. You know, in John's gospel, Jesus is clear. The devil is the father of lies, not the father of real persons, but false persons, person is the breath of God. 
That's the Spirit of God in clay. The devil doesn't breathe the Spirit of God or speak the Word of God. The logos of God, which creates everything that's, that's anything. If, if he speaks it, it's only because God forces it through him. In John 8, Jesus says, you are of your father the devil. And you know who he's talking to? You can go check this out. The Jews that had believed in him. Duh. Wow. Anyway, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will confess. Ex homo lageo. Ek homo and logos, out together word to God. Now some argue that this describes some sort of forced submission to God before the throne of God as if that would bring him glory. Glory to God, the God who is love. That would be as if I said, I swear on my life. I'm swearing. If Susan does not freely agree to marry me and love me, I will one day force her to marry me at gunpoint. And this will bring me glory as I cast her into eternal torment and never, never, never allow her to marry me ever again, even if she really, 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 really wants to. <laughs> See, just the suggestion is diabolical and absurd. And it reveals that the suggester knows very little of love and that the suggester knows very little of Scripture. Paul's quoting Isaiah, both here and in Philippians, where he also quotes the same verse, saying, God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, Yeshua, God is salvation, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess. Do you get that? Under the earth, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Isaiah, whom Paul has been quoting throughout the book of Romans, Isaiah is clearly prophesying salvation. How do we know that? Because he says salvation. Isaiah 45, verse 22. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn. God swears to do this. He did do this, and he's doing this right now. From my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word. That's logos in Greek. And we know that Jesus is the logos, the word, a word that shall not turn back. To me, every knee will bow. Every tongue will swear allegiance. And so Paul, Paul writes this. So why do you judge your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So why do we, because we do it all the time, why do we judge our brothers and sisters? Well, maybe it's because we don't believe that we'll all stand before the judgment seat of God. And what is the judgment seat of God? This is the judgment seat of God. And now I wish that I could instantly re-preach every sermon in Romans and most sermons I've preached for 20 years, but I can't. So hopefully you just seriously consider this idea. This is the judgment of seat of God. And we have all judged God's judgment which is the very definition of bad judgment, that is sin. But even that was according to God's judgment, which is good judgment, which is grace, which is the resurrection and the life. This is the tree in the middle of the garden. And this is the judgment seat. And this is the judgment seat. The mercy seat on top of the ark between the two cherubim that guard the way to the tree of life. This is the judgment seat in the temple. And this is the judgment seat because we know that his body is the temple and now check this out, it bleeds the life. And now this body is your body and now you are the temple. So this is also 
the judgment seat. You are the temple. The garden is in your soul. God has placed eternity in your hearts, right, Solomon. God is in you like his presence was in the temple, behind the curtain, between the cherubim, on top of the ark. And God is in your neighbor. So the way you relate to your neighbor is the way you relate to God. So on that day when you stand before the throne, he'll say something like this. As you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. The judgment seat is in you and the judgment seat is in your neighbor. And check this out, the judgment does not change. Perhaps we judge because we have not faced the judgment. And perhaps we judge because we forget who's being judged. We think that we're judging him. That's what we think. When in fact, he's the judgment of us. The devil tricked us into thinking we're the judge. That's why we take knowledge of good and evil from the tree and so crucify the life that is given on the tree. We think we're the judge and so we judge the judgment. We think that we are the standard. You know what I mean? So in other words, each one of us thinks that we are one. We're the, the one. We're one and so God's judgment is two. But Paul has taught us that God's judgment is one and we are two. I think I am one and the tree is two, but perhaps the tree is one and I am two. We each are an old self and a new self, an old Adam and a new Adam, a vessel of wrath and a vessel of mercy, a, a false self and the true self, an illusion and the reality, spawn of the devil and child of God, a child of God either lost or found, and usually both, right? Both Judas and Paul. Luke portrays Paul, this is wild, you can check it out in Acts, but like as a resurrected Judas, the 12th disciple. So perhaps we judge our brothers because we haven't faced the judgment. Perhaps we judge our brothers because we forget who's being judged. Perhaps we judge our brothers because we don't believe the judgment. The judge is one, the judgment is one, his word is one, this is what we learn, Romans 3, 2, and 2. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified by his grace as a gift. Romans 5, 19. By the one man's disobedience, the many, who is all, were made sinners, so that by the one man's obedience, the many, who is all, will be made righteous. Romans eleven thirty two. For God has consigned all to disobedience, they may have mercy, mercy on all. Hesed in Hebrew, relentless love on all. The judge is love. His judgment is love. His word is love. His commandment is love. God's judgment is that I would love as I've been loved, that I would be made in the image and likeness of love. My father is love. Abba. He who loves is born of God and knows God, writes John. And this is eternal life, prayed Jesus in the Gospel of John, that they know you, Father, Abba, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And Paul writes, listen closely to this. If anyone thinks that he knows something, like you got some knowledge of good and evil, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. That would be like a living God. You see, love is not information in your head that you can just use to judge your neighbor. Love is the life who stands on the throne and knows you in the sanctuary of your soul and judges you and judges all things into existence. The judge is love, his judgment is love, his word is love, his commandment is love. His commandment, John chapter 12, last verse, check it out, his commandment is eternal life, said Jesus. That's his commandment. 
And you see, the commandment of God is not optional. The commandment of God, the commandment of God is creation. It is reality. Everything else is an arrogant dream that God has allowed his children to dream on the sixth day of creation before we awaken to the seventh day, the eternal day, when and where everything is good and it is finished. And we freely will what our Father wills and all creation wills the kingdom of heaven. The judgment of God is salvation. And God is salvation, Yeshua, Jesus. So anyway, Paul quotes Isaiah where God commands salvation and he asks this question. So why do you judge your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will confess, will give praise to God. So then, verse 12, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Literally, we will give logon. We will give logos, word of self, to God. So you will give an account of yourself. Your old self and your new self. Your true self. Your false self and your true self. An account of your old man who is the tapas, right? Remember, we talked about this, the, the imprint, the form of the new man, the old man that you think you have created, and an account of the new man who is the logos that fills the old man, revealing the true man that God has created. You'll give an account of the spawn of the devil, your sin, and an account, a testimony to the word of God incarnate in you, that's grace. You will give a testimony. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So maybe we judge our brother because we're utterly unaware that each of us will give an account of himself. Both selves. Old self and new self. The self on the left is the imitation Christ, the false Christ. In Greek, the Antichrist. And the self on the right is Christ, who rises from the dead in the tomb that is me and makes my old self himself. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, to use the words of Paul. Not Mises, but Jesus. You understand, the me on the left cannot be justified. All your problems are the me on the left. So good riddance to the me on the left. And the me on the right. <laughs> oh, he needs no justification. He's the justifier in you. And you see, that means that there is no me that wants to compete or that gets offended and needs to be defended or hide or feel shame. There is a me that's different than everyone. I mean, the shape of every, everyone is a little bit different, right? The shape of the sin and the shape of the grapes. There, there, there is a me that's different than everyone, but there is no me that's better or worse than anyone. There is no me that has any interest in judging my neighbor. In my Bible, under this verse, Romans 14, 12, I wrote this. I will, I will surrender me. I can run from the judgment for a time, but the only place to hide is deeper and deeper in the dream, you see, which has turned into a nightmare, which I will ultimately, or could ultimately, experience as that thing that we call hell. But Jesus descends into hell, and he's waking me from my dream. And so this is the judgment that I cannot forever avoid. I must lose my psyche and find it. I must lose me and find me in Jesus. I I'm not this, <laughs> a vessel of wrath, a container for the breath of God. You know, like, and then seal it up. 
the life of God, the logos of God. I'm not, I'm not a tomb. I'm this. A vessel of mercy, a conduit for life. The life is in the blood. When I wake to this, I lose my life and I find it. I'm flooded with my life, a river of life, which is actually Christ's life, the eternal life of love. I'm flooded with love. Just like Rian Swigalar was flooded with love. And so Rian Swigalar still looks like Rian Swigalar, much to the chagrin of his critics. And yet it's very possible that Rian Swigalar is now filled with an entirely new substance. <laughs> the judgment of God. Love. So what do I do? What do I do with Rian Swigalar? Or ask it this way, is it safe for me to love Rion Svigalar? If his old self is just faking a new self, I could get myself crucified. But if his old self is now filled with his new self, I better love that self or I might just deliver Christ up for crucifixion in the body of Rion Svigalar. So is it safe to hug Rion Svigalar? Remember C.S. Lewis wrote, the only place safe from the danger of love is hell. And so what do I do with Rion Spiegelar? Well, I don't judge him. I just hug the hell out of him. And in the process, the hell out of me. And now you, you might say, you might rightly say, you may have been saying this this whole sermon. Well, come on, Peter. Sorry for yelling, but you were yelling inside, right? Come on, Peter. Don't we have to judge? Yeah. Every time you take a bite of food, you have judged the food. I'm going to eat this food. You judge the food. You, you decide to place it in your mouth. Every time you step into your day, you judge the day and what you will do with that day. Every decision is a judgment. We judge the food, but we aren't to judge the people that judge the food. We don't judge people, in other words, according to dietary laws. And we judge each day, but we don't judge the people that decide to observe one day or not observe one day. We, you see, we don't even judge people according to the Ten Commandments. According to Paul, apparently. Because, you know, keeping the Sabbath day is one of the big ten but Scripture doesn't make much of a distinction between the Big Ten and the other commandments in, in the Old uh, Testament. We're the ones that, that do that. Paul just told us that love fulfills the entire law. And yet you see, love is impossible to judge because love is a decision that's made in the sanctuary of a soul. So think about this. Murder is a decision to not love life, but take life. It's a decision made in the depths of one's soul. So just being angry can be murder, according to Jesus. And it's real confusing about what's going on with soldiers, and we argue about all that stuff. Adultery is a decision to not love a person, but use a person. It's a decision made in the depths of one's soul. Idolatry is a decision to use God rather than surrender to God. It's a decision to not love as you've been loved and it's made in the depths of one's soul. And a lie is a decision to not love the truth in the depths of one's soul and Jesus is the truth. And Sabbath breaking is a decision to not believe that it is finished and everything is good. It's a decision that's made or not made in the depths of your soul. And Sabbath keeping is faith, regardless of the day of the week. And I cannot judge faith, hope, or love in another person's soul. And it's only faith, hope, or love that makes a soul right rather than wrong. So yeah, I must judge things. And that's great. That's called science and technology. And as a society, you must judge actions. So the cop reads the radar gun and says, yeah, you were going 85 and a 55, so you owe the governing authorities 500 bucks. That's great. And as a friend or a coach, I might judge works and say, you know, try planting your feet before you swing or keep your eye on the ball, but I cannot judge the love and the sanctuary of my neighbor's soul or even my own soul. I can't judge love because love 
is the judgment that's judging me. God is love. I, I can't judge love, but love is constantly judging me. Or I should say, not judging me. <laughs> Which, in fact, is the judgment, the eternal judgment, grace. Love is eternal. Another way to say that is love is unconditional. That means love is not simply a decision in space and time. Love is the decision that conditions all of space and time, which means that all of space and time is forgiven by love and so created by love, our creator. Love is absolute grace, and absolute grace is the judgment of God that is God. In John, Jesus says this. These are just crazy verses. The Father judges no one. And then like a chapter later, he says, I judge no one. And yet he has already said, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light. I am the light. God is the light and Jesus is the light of the world. The light conquers the darkness simply by the appearance of his coming. The epiphanao, or epiphany of his parousia, to use Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians. He conquers simply by appearing to Paul on the road to Damascus. Simply by appearing to John on the island of Patmos. Simply by appearing in a satanic church to Rion Svigalar, if in fact that happened. And I bet you money that it did happen. Because 27 years ago, something like that happened to me. And I recognized the catch in Rion's voice and the reality to which he testified. Something like that happened to me, and I'm telling you, for 27 years, I've wondered why doesn't it just happen all the time? And yet it is happening all the time. And I think that's Rion Swigalar's point. It happened when Mary hugged him at the radio station. And you know, when it happened to me, I recognized it. <laughs> it had been everywhere in my world. More so than Rion's world. Well, believe it or not, I've known a Satanist or two. For about 14 years, I even prayed for a friend who had been ritually wed to Satan, and I've encountered Satan. I know that's weird, but not just his demons, Satan manifesting in her, and at least one or, or maybe two others for whom Susan and I have, have prayed. Jesus has had us pray all sorts of prayers and undo all sorts of covenants and rituals and oaths, but in every instance, every instance, the real battle has always been to help a person simply see Jesus, who appears in every hell in which a person might find themselves, and people see in different ways. But the battle is to help a person look into the eyes of infinite love, because when they do, everything changes. <laughs> just like Good Friday changes into Easter. Because everything is Good Friday changing into Easter. Everything is the revelation of love, unconditional love, who is filling all things with love, that is himself. God is love. And God is a consuming fire. Once Jesus showed our friend that when she forgave her abusers, she literally bled fire from the very wounds that those abusers had inflicted. Fire upon them. That's the judgment of God. Mercy. Later that week, she served communion at her evening service and saw the same fire in the communion cup. The judgment of God. The wrath of God, which is the mercy of God. The blood of the Lamb. More times than I can count, we've called on the fire of God, which is the burning coals from the altar, which destroy the work of the devil and set the children of God free to love and be loved. The fire is in me. And, hear me now, the fire is in you. On one of those occasions that we prayed for her, Jesus appeared to her in this particular vision, and she said to me, Jesus is not holding me. Why is he not holding me in, in the vision? And I said, I don't know. 
I said, ask him. And so she did. She was quiet for a minute, and then she said, I just heard him say, I am holding you. (laughs) And I was holding her. (laughs) On another occasion, Jesus appeared to my friend and to my wife, and he was answering our questions. Utterly horrified at the works of Satan, angry with Jesus for allowing it in the first place, and confused about what I was having to preach in the Revelation, I said to my friend, I said, listen, ask Jesus, why don't you just throw Satan in the lake of fire? And so she, she did. She asked Jesus, got quiet for a moment, and then she said, I just heard him say, I am. All the time. You understand? If you want to destroy the work of the devil, stop judging people and start welcoming people, accepting people, hugging people. And your judgment of non judgment will burn the devil like fire because it actually is fire. It's the judgment of God, it's unconditional love, it's grace. And he's not dead. (laughs) I think that's probably why we judge. We think he's dead. And he's not dead. Love is alive and love can do whatever he desires. And so Mary, the lady at the radio station, didn't judge Rion Sfigelar. In the words of Paul, she welcomed Rion Sfigelar. She just reached out and (laughs) gave him a big old hug to Rion Sfigelar. And God judged the hell out of Rion Svigalar. And heaven into Rion Svigalar. The love in Mary was the same love that appeared to Rion Svigalar and knocked him to the floor, just as love knocked St. Paul or Saul of Tarsus to the ground and turned him into the apostle of grace. Love's not dead. He's alive. And you are his body. Now, before we finish up, let me just say, even if, okay, even if Rian Sfigalar was just lying in that video, even if Satan could cast out Satan or would cast out Satan, even if Satan could confess Jesus as Lord, which I don't think he can, we would still need to find Rian Sfigalar, hug Rian Sfigalar, and love Rian Sfigalar, So love would judge the hell out of all of us and heaven into all of us, including Rion Sfigalar, our brother. Romans chapter 15, verse 7. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And so... He took bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup, saying, This is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Peter, James, John, Judah, Judas, and Joseph, Jacob, and Esau, Cain, and Abel, Eve, and Adam, and Rion, and Paul. Amen. And so we were just singing I'm standing in your presence. This is the judgment seat right here. And now let me ask you, were you judging yourself? (laughs) Were you? Yeah. For like 60 years, I've been judging the hell out of myself. And all I end up doing is judging more hell into myself. You know, St. Paul said, it's a small thing I'm judged by you. I don't even judge myself, which is just such a crazy statement. But he says, I leave it for the day. But you know what? The day is now. (laughs) 
That's the Sabbath day. Uh, that Sabbath day is in your heart. And so Paul is not antinomian. He's not against the law. He says love fulfills the entire law. But, but what's going on when I'm judging myself? I'm not believing God's judgment. And so what can I do? Well, I can just go into that inner sanctuary in the depths of the temple, and, and I can stand in his presence. And the love of God in Christ Jesus will judge the hell out of me and judge the heaven into me. Because you can't you see, I don't even know really who I am. I, I, I don't know the difference between the I am not and the I am. I just know there is a difference, and I know I'm the one thing and, and not the other. So, so stop judging the hell out of yourself and just submit to the judgment. And let God judge his heaven into you. And don't sit down. There's just, I just want to mention this one last. I thought this was fascinating. I watched a bunch of Rian Swigalar videos, which, which were fascinating. Like I said, some things I think, yeah, some things I think, no. But, but one thing he said, he said of the thousands of applications that he had read for membership in the Satanic Church of South Africa, he said most of them listed rejection by Christians. <laughs> That's their reason for... Wanting to apply. I just, I think maybe that's true. See, when we go around judging people, isn't it weird that we end up judging the hell into people and into, and into ourselves? But when we accept people, what do we do? We're not saying that whatever they do is right or whatever they believe is right. When we accept people, we break the lie that they are rejected and alone. Destroy the work of the devil and become the judgment of God, the walking, talking, living body of unconditional love. So, um, you may not know many Satanists. But trust me, you know a lot of people that are in bondage to Satan. So if you really want to judge the hell out of people, if you really want to do something about this, don't judge them, hug them. And love will do all the judging. In other words, believe the gospel and you become the gospel. Amen.